Welcome to the second how to play video for Torch and Shield. In this video we will explore some of the more advanced rules concepts, such as special actions, outnumbered contests and monster activations. If you haven't already, you should check out the how to play basics video first, as it covers off on the mechanics of the game. Let's go back down into the underworld and pick up from where we left our dwarves last time. Last turn, the Iron Thanes were handed a beating. The Copperbrow clansman Arik shot the Shortbeard Lum with his Firelock. This put Lum in the wounded state, and all of his other characteristics got reduced by one. Worse still, the Shortbeard Corder got tangled up in a fight with the Copperbrow Thane Gaston. His breastplate saved some of the damage, but he has taken one damage. That's not all the Iron Thanes need to worry about. A Dark Dweller has crawled out of the Abyss and threatens their rear. It can't be ignored. Let's crack on with the delving phase and see what they can do about it. Once again, both crews will get one card for each warrior. Three for the Iron Thanes and two for the Copper Brows. The Copper Brows have a Jack of Clubs from last turn which the hero Gaston sheathed using his leader trait. The Copper Brows have drawn a Joker. They can use this card to activate a warrior at any time in the activation order. And the card can count as the suit of their choice. It is good to hang on to these if you can saving them for the perfect moment. The Copper Brows choose not to use the Joker yet. Instead, they wait to see what the Iron Thane player does. The Iron Thanes have the initiative with the Ace of Spades. The suit of your activation card matters, because the card suits enable your warriors to take specific special actions. In the core rules, there are eight special actions, which can be used by all dwarves. When you activate a dwarf with the right suit, you may choose to activate that dwarf with the relevant special action. Special actions allow your warriors to turn the battle in their favor, or better react to the enemy player's moves. So with the Ace of Spades, the Iron Thanes have the option of performing a defend special action. Defending allows you to hold off the enemy by fighting defensively, but if you win the contest, you cause no hits. A spade also gives you the option of a search special action. Warriors can use this action to search for treasure, and in some scenarios allows you to locate objectives. Neither of these options are particularly appealing to the Iron Thanes right now, so they opt for a standard move and engage action. Varka decides to engage the clansman Arex before he can reload his firelock. Now the Copper Brows can activate with the Queen of Hearts. Hearts gives you the option to Fury, which boosts a warrior's martial skill and move as long as they can see the enemy. Hearts also allows you to set Overwatch special actions, so you can shoot your enemies as they enter your line of fire. Gaston decides to unleash his Dwarven Fury on Varka and charges into combat. As Arex is already engaged and is supporting Gaston, he doesn't have many options. However, all warriors must activate. Arex decides to grumble. Dwarves grumble about many things and it is a standard action you can issue your warriors when you aren't sure what to do with them. Now that both Copper Brows have activated, they can sheathe the Joker for future turns. The Iron Thanes still have the short beards to go. Seven of Clubs first. Activating your warriors with clubs allows you to either challenge your foes to a duel or jump up. As both the Iron Thanes are knocked down, they may not perform a duel. Jump up is the obvious choice. Usually there are restrictions on standing up your warriors. They may not do so if engaged or in a combat zone. Once standing, they may only move two spaces. Jump up allows you to stand up your warrior, even if they are engaged, and perform a full standard action as if they did not start the turn knocked down. The wounded Shortbeard Lum jumps up. Despite his injuries, Lum decides to assist Varka. He moves around and engages Arex. Varka was engaged in an outnumbered contest, but no longer. By engaging Arex in this way, Lum has split the fight into two separate one-on-one -on -one contests. In Torch and Shield, there are never any mass combats. All contests will either be one-on-one -on -one or one-on-many referred to as outnumbered contests. As models move and engage, contests will split and change based on the activations. 
All that's left is to activate Corda with the Six of Spades. He won't perform a special action as he needs to deal with the Dark Dweller. He performs a normal stand-up action. He's allowed to move half his move characteristic after standing normally. Corda stares the creature down bravely. Now we move on to the monster phase. Last turn, all the lanterns and torches burned out, so all warriors are shrouded. This means all warriors will need to test for danger in the dark. For each shrouded warrior, you must roll 2d6 and check against the danger in the dark table. If you roll high or low, something bad might happen. The other warriors pass their tests okay, but not Corda. He has rolled a 10. This means a swarm monster has dropped from the ceiling beside him. It's a nasty little grub demon. Now it's the monster's turn to activate. Starting with the largest and working down to the smallest, the monsters activate in turn. Monsters activate according to their profile. This is the profile for a Dark Dweller. The monster profile shows the usual characteristics and traits, but it also shows the monster actions. To activate a monster, we look at its actions starting at the top and work our way down until we find one that applies. Each action has a handy icon for quick recognition. Let's look at the Dark Dweller's first action, Snare. It has the sword icon, which means it occurs if the Dark Dweller is engaged. The Dark Dweller is not engaged, so we move down to the next action. Brush has the eye icon, which occurs if the Dark Dweller has an enemy warrior in line of sight. Corda is in the Dark Dweller's line of sight, so we resolve that action. Had there been no Dwarf in the Dark Dweller's line of sight, we would resolve the last action, which is the default action, for when no other action can apply. Now Corda is engaged in an outnumbered contest with both monsters. As we now move on to the fight phase, we can see how this contest turns out. In an outnumbered contest, the side that outnumbers the other must choose one model to be the attacker. All other models will support that model in the contest. For monsters, the attacker is always the largest monster in the contest. In this case, the Dark Dweller will be the attacker. Each supporting model will add one to the martial skill of the attacker. Then it is resolved like any other contest. However, the monsters are in the dark. Whenever a monster is shrouded, it will gain an extra plus one to its martial skill. Furthermore, shrouded monsters will automatically win any drawn contests. So now the Dark Dweller will roll six dice. The Dark Dweller has scored four successes compared to Corda's one. Usually you would score a hit for each success over and above your opponents. But the Dark Dweller can only cause a maximum of two hits in a contest. This is because of the agility limit rule. A model may never inflict more hits than their agility characteristic. The Dark Dweller has an agility of 2. Therefore, its agility limit is 2, and it can only cause 2 hits at most. Before we resolve these hits though, another rule will come into play. Drag. Usually after scoring hits, you drive back the opponent into a square behind. But Brood Monsters have the drag trait. This means instead of pushing models back one space, they drag them back two spaces toward the nearest monster entrance. Any warrior that enters a monster entrance for any reason is removed as a casualty. They have been dragged kicking and screaming into the darkness. Poor Corda gets dragged two spaces and is removed from the game. Let's see how the other warriors are going. The wounded shortbeard Lum tries to take on the clansman Arix. Because Lum is still in the wounded state, all his characteristics have been reduced by one and thus he will roll two dice. Arex, on the other hand, is unhurt and will roll his base four dice. Arex gets one more success than Lum and therefore scores one hit. Lum is driven back. If a warrior ever has no spaces to be driven back into, they count as cornered. Hits against cornered models in the fight phase get to add plus one to their strength. Knockdown models always count as cornered. Because Lum has already taken two damage, his resilience has been reduced to zero. That means the hit that Arik scored will be rolling five dice. But Lum can still try to make a save roll with his shield. The save roll is a success. The hit is negated. 
Mum is safe, for now. Now the fight between Gaston and Varka. If Varka wins, it could turn the game toward the Iron Things. But Gaston is the better fighter, and he has taken the Fury special action this turn, so he will be tough to beat. Again, it's dice equal to martial skill, plus one extra dice for Gaston due to Fury. Varka fights well, and even Gaston's Fury isn't enough to win the contest. But Gaston has a heroic characteristic, Valor, and now is the time to use it. By expending his Valor point, Gaston can change one unsuccessful dice into a success. He does this to change that three into a success. Now the fight is a draw. As we learnt earlier, the two-handed sword has riposte and wins all draws. So Gaston inflicts one hit on Varka. Varka is driven back. Now to resolve the hit. Varka has a resilience of two, but gets plus one to his resilience against any hits, due to his mail armor. The hit is at strength seven, five for Gaston plus two for the two-handed sword. So Gaston will be rolling four dice to try and damage Varka. Gaston has rolled three sixes on the damage roll. This is a special result in Torch and Shield called Instant Death. When three sixes are rolled on the damage roll, the enemy warrior is killed immediately. Maybe they are run through, decapitated or disemboweled. Either way, they are removed from the game and if you are playing a campaign, removed from your crew. Now on to the event phase and all engagements end. First, Lum must test to turn back. This is because the Iron Thane crew has lost more than half of its warriors. As he is the only Iron Thane left, he tests against his nerve characteristic, which is two. However, he is in the wounded state, so it is reduced by one. Whether by bravery, stupidity, or a desire for revenge, Lum decides to keep fighting. There are no models within range to capture the treasure and no light sources left. So we skip those steps and move on to the last step, the event card. It's now the Iron Thane turn to draw the event. This is because the player controlling the Iron Thanes is the Fated One this turn. The Fated One is decided before the game, and then switches to the other player each alternate event phase. The Fated One also gets to decide the order conflicts are resolved and decide any ambiguities. An Ace of Diamonds means a trap has been triggered. It's a spike trap under Lum. Lum has seconds to detect the trap to avoid danger. A successful craft test will allow him to detect the trap and avoid it, moving to an adjacent space. If he fails, he will be affected by the hazard. Somehow Lum passes this test as well. If he survives this, he might just make it as a delver. The spike trap becomes a hazard that remains in the area of play. Any model that enters that space will be affected by it automatically. There are no craft tests to avoid it once it has appeared. That ends the turn. That is also the end of this Torch and Shield video. You should now have a good understanding of how to play the game. You have not yet seen all the dangers of the underworld though. There are plenty of surprises still in store. Grab your hammer, your torch and your shield. Because there is no better way to learn than to lead your crew into the underworld. Good luck and good delving.